In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities we have been provided and of our ability to continue to be great men and to strive to become even better. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is it on now? Cool. Okay. So hi, everybody. My capstone presentation today is about pitching recovery and uh, the different types of effectivenesses of, of the different types of pitching recovery. So to start off, uh, this paper's goal was to determine um, the diff how effective different types of pitching recovery were um, by looking at active recovery, passive recovery, thermo thermotherapy, cryotherapy, electric muscle stimulation. Um, in the context of a pitcher making a start every five or six days. Uh, recovery is really uh, like important for pitchers because uh, pitching is a very irregular movement and it puts a lot of stress on different the different parts of the body. Um, and so being able to go, having to go five or six, every fifth or sixth day is really important for starting pitchers. So the evaluation was done based off of how a pitcher feels while doing and after doing uh, a certain type of uh, recovery. Uh, how it alleviates um, delayed onset muscle soreness as well as blood lactate concentration and how uh, it restores range of motion while performing this recovery. And so based on these criteria, the most effective recovery method was actually found to be active recovery, which I will get to in the next slide. So active recovery, what active recovery is, is using different types of movement to stimulate blood flow in the body to alleviate delayed onset muscle soreness, blood lactate concentration. Uh, delayed onset muscle soreness is the soreness you feel in your body after a particularly intense workout that happens anywhere between 12 and 48 hours after the workout is done. You don't feel it while you're doing it, which is why it, it's really hard to uh, fight against it because you don't know you're gonna get it until a day after, usually. And blood lactate concentration is just the lactic acid buildup in your muscles after a workout. And what that does is makes your muscles feel heavy, makes your muscles feel sore. Um, and that, again, is just something that you don't, it, it, having that kind of stuff without alleviating it is something that can increase like injury risk in pitchers and that kind of stuff. Um, so things like lifting weights, running, swimming, biking, yoga, mobility stretches are all ways that pitchers can perform active recovery. Um, especially yoga, as not only does it lengthen the muscles, um, increase blood flow, and it also helps with range of motion, not only regaining lost range of motion, but also um, uh, regain lost range of motion, but also increase that range of motion after it's done. Um, and because of the various like forms of active recovery, there's a, it's very like it's a very uh, all-encompassing type of type of recovery. It's something for everybody, and it's not limited to space or like capacity or equipment. Anybody can do it anywhere at any time. Um, and because of the effect it has on the body, uh, how, the, how the pitcher feels and how it alleviates delayed onset muscle soreness, lactic acid buildup, uh, that's why I determined that to be the most effective form of recovery in my, uh, in my study. The next type of recovery is passive recovery. And this is, the op this is like the 180 of active recovery. This is just how your body naturally um, recovers. So what passive recovery is, is just letting the body just do its thing and just kind of sitting there. And over the course of a day or two, your body will naturally flush out any, any kind of soreness or any kind of lactic acid buildup. Um, some, some things like steam rooms, massages, where you're not exerting yourself are ways that people pass passively recover. Um, but it's actually not the most effective form of recovery for the reason that while it can provide a mental break for an athlete, it when you have to make a start every fifth day, it's not the most effective way to recover your body for the most part. So the third form of recovery that I have is called cryotherapy. And this is using kind of like cold elements like ice or ice water or like cold packs, that kind of stuff on the body um, following some kind of game or workout or something like that. And what happens is when you submerge yourself in cold water or use ice, it forces the blood vessels in your body to constrict 
cutting off blood flow to some degree. Um, by exiting that body of water or that cold element, you open the muscles back up, which actually helps accelerate um, the f like your blood flow, flushing out any kind of uh, lactic acid or any kind of buildup that you don't want in your body that makes you feel uh, sore or tired or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it also kind of is a mental challenge because part of pitching is the mental is the mental side where you have to be mentally able to pitch six or seven innings, uh, be in tough spots, have guys on base, and that kind of stuff. And so it's mentally challenging in that the water is very uncomfortable to be in. It's kind of a mental – it's a mental challenge to stay in the water um, and let your body get used to it instead of immediately – everybody's reaction is just, I'll jump out. And you got to just stay in and, like, let the cold water kind of help you out. Um, and so overall, cryotherapy hasn't really been found to be more effective than active recovery. Um, it's – a lot less versi versatile than active recovery is. Um, and while it's a good, like, access, the kind of good to be used as a couple with active recovery, it's not actually the most effective one to use. And then on the other end of the spectrum is thermotherapy, which is using heating elements like heating pads, hot tubs. Uh, but I think steam rooms can sometimes fall into this. Um, saunas, heat wraps, that kind of stuff. All forms of uh, thermotherapy. And what that does is uh, changes the temperature of the body's soft tissues, um, which loosens the muscles up and allows for increased blood flow throughout uh, throughout the body. It's similar to how you sit out if you sit out in the sun and you feel yourself loosening up versus when you're cold, you tighten up. It's sort of like that kind of effect. Um, and so the way the blood vessels work is by increasing core temperatures, you increase the sympathetic active vasodilator nerve activity, which is what regulates blood flow in your skin and in your muscles and that kind of stuff. So by heating your core temperature up, you actually make, you actually increase the amount of blood flow that can like flow through your body through this, through that, through that. Um, and overall it has a lot of benefits, but it's not as, it's not, it's a more comfortable like alternative to cryotherapy, but it's not the most effective because active recovery is still more versatile and still uh, easier to use to some degree. And then the final recovery method was electric muscle stimulation. And this is actually a newer form of recovery um, that's been developed through today's technology. W what it does, it's a machine that you attach uh, electric diodes to your body, like, like sticky pads. And what they do is they are supposed to be able to shock your muscles um, using low voltage shocks to force your muscles to flex and relax. Um, and by doing this, it increases blood flow, reduces, which helps you reduce late onset muscle soreness, as well as uh, blood, la like blood lactate concentration, that kind of stuff. And the big plus with this recovery method is that you're able to target specific muscles. So like active recovery might not be able to help you, help you hit like your scapular muscle back here, or like some part like your lat or something like that that you can't normally get with an active recovery. You can hit it with electric muscle stimulation, which is more centralized on it's able to be used to target specific muscle groups, which is for pitchers who don't want to who don't want to tax their body, but just want to recover their arm, the muscles in their or in, in and around their arm. This is a a, a good alternative. Um, and overall, it's a really close second to EMF or to uh, active recovery, but because of the fact that it's not as widely available as this newer technology, it's harder to find and harder to get. Um, active recovery takes this one because of the fact that it's more versatile. It's more versatile. And you don't need this equipment to be able to do it. You can just do some kind of movement, and, you and, and that, that can be your go. can be your recovery. So, in conclusion, active recovery is the most effective form of recovery found. Uh, it can be done anywhere. There's no limit to equipment. There's no limit to space. You could do it in a small room. You can do it on a big field with any equipment that you have around you, uh, in any capacity. Uh, again, EMS just isn't that widely available to people um, without paying a lot of money to have it or if you or some people just aren't comfortable with getting shocked like that. Um, so that's why ultimately recovery is just an athlete's preference is it an athlete's preference. Um, everybody's different. Everybody likes to do different things with their body. But uh, ultimately the most effective form of recovery uh, a pitcher can use trying to make a start every fifth or sixth day is active recovery because of uh, the variety of ways you can recover that it offers to a pitcher. So, thank you. I'll just leave that up. It's fine. Yes, yes. I use 
I like to use a mix of active recovery and EMS. Um, I like to kind of do like sprints or I do. I have a, it's called a Mark. The biggest one's called the Mark Pro. Um, that's the most, that's the best one. It has four diodes that you can attach to four different parts of your body. And it's got a whole guide that has you, shows you how to use it and all that stuff. And so I, I, we have that available. I have that available to me for after I pitch. I can use it the day after or whenever I feel sore. It helps me kind of day after pitching helps my body feel better for overall. But, you know, I've used, I've used all of these before. I've tested them. And the best ones, the most, the ones I like the most are active recovery and EMS. So. Um, I have no, I'm not sure actually, because I actually haven't talked to him. I feel like he would, I feel like he would like the cryotherapy. I feel like he'd like to be, he, like, he likes being able to put ice on people. He likes putting ice on people. So that's all it is. So, but I think, I think he, I think he would agree with me with what I'm saying. Thank you. No problem. No problem. All right, so um, I did my capstone internship on um, with a company called Titan. Um, so Titan is an investigative alliance, um, and a little bit of a uh, short, brief uh, thing about the business is uh, they provide surveillance and um, information to clients on um, insurance claims uh, that uh, the clients make against um, their employees who they feel uh, may be lying about the condition um, they are experiencing and trying to uh, extort them for money. And they also uh, go out in cars, um, uh, use cameras to obtain this surveillance footage um, that they are that they use to um, in the courts for these cases. So uh, some of the tasks that I uh, did while on the job, um, I had to cut and review um, sur surveillance videos that were sent in by clients. Um, I had to edit them to include uh, parts that were useful to the investigation. So I cut out any parts that um, the uh, person wasn't in the video. Um, also, I had to take uh, still images of the people to include in the uh, written reports. Um, while at the um, internship, I also did some tedious tasks, such as just like shredding papers, stuff like that, helping ar out around the um, office. Um, and I also had to research um, upcoming and former cases uh, that the company uh, laid out for me. So I got to collect information on the internet using um, their, uh, I guess it's technology called Gotcha. So basically, um, you deep dive into their social media and um, uh, the internet to find readily available information about uh, the person that you're completing the surveillance on. And some of the experiences I had in the office. So I got to experience the office environment uh, for the first time and how it works. And I think this could easily help me in my next job or in my next internship that I have to complete. 
Um, I also got to work alongside others um, that are, who are much older than me, uh, which was a new experience. Um, never got to do that before, so it was definitely new to be working uh, with people my parents' age, and um, yeah, never got to experience something like that before, and we got along very well in the office, so. I also got to experience uh, a difficult workload of a uh, normal nine to five job, also experiencing um, the stress of it and uh, what comes along with that. And I really enjoyed being a part of the team trying to solve these cases um, and provide useful information to others to prove that people are like taking advantage of this system in place. And I also really enjoyed going through um, the videos that they provided uh, for me to edit. So my takeaways from this internship, I think it was a great opportunity. Um, and I think that my biggest takeaway uh, from my time in the office is to limit my distractions. Um, I think it's uh, very difficult to limit distractions in the office or school, anywhere you are, there's always gonna be distractions. So I think doing this internship helped me to um, experience those dis distractions firsthand uh, in a working environment. Um, and although it, this isn't a job that I could see myself doing in the future, I think it gave me some really good experience to get out into the, the quote unquote real world and um, experience a real like job that I could, like not a job that I would do, but um, an uh, environment that I could be a part of in the future. And I think uh, for my first internship, it went really well. And I hope this opportunity will lead to more uh, internships in the future. And I'm very thankful uh, for the opportunity that Mr. Anthony uh, gave to me, the owner uh, of the uh, business. And I wanna thank his employees uh, that helped me out while I was there and gave me, uh, and helped me out uh, with uh, doing the videos and all that, because it was a, it was definitely uh, a new experience for me to learn how to uh, edit all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, I feel like, did you play the private eye? Like, that was um, yeah, it was kind of like, um, like they would uh, spy on people kind of kind of yeah. thing uh, in the cars. Eye. Yeah, like in the cars, and they would just take videos of them uh, doing like normal stuff, like going to the grocery store and stuff to prove that they weren't really like injured, as I said, because some people would be like, they broke their leg or something, and they would just be like walking into the store normally. Did you actually go into the store? No, no, I didn't have the opportunity to. Um, because of COVID, we couldn't really go in uh, cars with other people, but uh, yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Sutherland, and I did my capstone internship with Archbishop Curley's own Mr. McGinty. Um, so just a little background info on me. Uh, I've always been interested in physical fitness. I've played sports basically since I was born, and it's always just something I've wanted to be around. Um, my first job was as a lifeguard just because I wanted to do something outside. Um, so, that, so that was just Physical therapy was a natural career choice for me. It always sort of felt right, and it's the career I'm deciding to pursue at this moment. So I will be attending Temple University next fall, majoring in kinesiology, which is the study of body movement. Uh, hopefully to someday get into Temple's phys physical therapy program. And um, 
one of the greatest things I think I've got to experience is I've met some incredible people in this career path. Uh, this includes Ms. Spriginti. Um, also, Nick Kundrat is a man. He's a type 1 diabetic, which I am as well. That's how I met him. He's a health practitioner and a movement specialist. He's starting a business called B Blueprint Wellness, and he's going to sort of just take over that and uh, try to run with it. Um, and he also wrote a book called Positively Type 1, which I was featured in. I got to write a little snippet in. And uh, so that book is out. I really recommend. Go check it out. Go check out my section. Um, so that, I mean, he, he's fantastic. He's helped me so much. He's, he's already offering me internships years down the line just because we've grown so close. Um, and Kim Peterson is someone I interviewed from my anatomy class, and then I uh, have gone and talked to her a couple times. She is a physical therapist. Uh, she's worked with many different groups, so I've gotten to learn so much from her. She's worked with disabled children, senior citizens, and recovering athletes, and everyone in between. Um, so just getting to sort of pick her out, pick her, chew, chew her ear, and... Um, figure out what she's doing is something that's been so helpful to me because it sounds exactly like what I would want to do. And then I did have a couple internship struggles coming into the year. Um, I had internships set up with Kennedy Krieger, which was actually through Miss Peterson, and a company called Active like Life Fitness, which is this just down the road from me. Um, but those were canceled due to corona, um, unfortunately. So I went to Miss Joe's, and I said, Miss Joe's, I don't know what to do. And uh, she was able to help me out. Um, me and Mr. McGinty got together, and it ended up being a really great experience. So um, my experience with Mr. McGinty started off with just a couple meetings, trying to figure out what we would do. Uh, Mr. McGinty had st done stuff like this in the past, so he was able to help guide me. So the first thing we did was um, I worked with a nurse for a couple days because she uses a program called SNAP Health Center. Uh, every time a student visits the nurse, she has to... Uh, mark that down and make sure that's um, make sure that's something that is kept as data. So I was able to work with the nurse, figure out how that works, and then change it just a little bit, tweak it, so that Ms. McGinty can use the same program for injuries rather than illnesses. And so that's what Ms. McGinty will be using from now on. Um, so after I got familiar with that, I was able to sort of teach it to Ms. McGinty just to make the process more familiar from now on. And um, then from there, we would enter in old injury reports. Unfortunately, there's no sports happening right now. So we were unable to work with new students. I don't want our athletes getting injured, but it would have been nice to see a couple of them. Yeah, what's up? Um, so this, do you think that this new, um, the thing that the nurse uses that is going to, what do you call it again? Snap. Snap. Do we think that that's like something Mr. McGinty is now familiar with? Uh, yes, so SNAP is, I worked with the nurse just a couple of periods, and then once I was familiar enough with it, just started teaching to Mr. McGinty, and he was super happy with it, turned out just like he wanted, and so that's something he will be able, be able to use for curly athletes down the line just for the next couple of years, yeah. Uh, yes, almost certainly, actually. I'm going to go back to Active Life Fitness, try to reset that up. Um, I will be working as a lifeguard again this summer, so I'm going to have to work around that, but yeah.
right, so um, I am Sam. Um, my presentation is on Andrew Jackson and how he expanded the federal office of the executive branch. Um, so starting off, he had very humble origins. He was born in a really small community in South Carolina. Um, his father died pretty young, so he didn't have that father figure. Um, he grew up in a backwards environment, um, which would become a figure in his, uh, become a, a notable thing during his uh, campaign. Um, and at the end of the Revolutionary War, which he fought in, he was without a family, losing his brothers and his mother. Um, and then flash forward to the War of 1812, which is where he really gained a national presence. Um, he has to defend New Orleans with a volunteer army. Um, there he like uh, gains camaraderie with his uh, troops, and he gains the name Old Hickory. Um, he also puts down the Creek Uprisings, which will be a notable thing, putting, uh, putting down Native Americans. Um, he then places New, uh, New Orleans under martial law, which will later be cited by Lincoln when he puts Maryland under martial law. Um, and ultimately, he defeats the British overwhelmingly at New Orleans, and he becomes a national hero. Um, and then afterwards, uh, there's the Treaty of Fort Jackson, um, which is like the first step to him expelling the natives. Um, and what that really does is it's a domino effect. Once he expels them out for getting their land, um, that basically opens up the South for plantations and the rise of the cotton industry, which will later lead to the Civil War. Um, and then later he would go into Spanish Florida. He would, you know, take out the Seminoles there as Jackson was wont to do. And then he's installed as a military governor. Um, then you go to 1824, um, and many people calling for him to be president because he's really popular. Um, they see him as a man to cl clean up corruption. He's seen as an honest man um, that goes back to his camaraderie with his troops. Um, there's also voter expansion that occurs here. A lot of, a lot more blacks are able to vote in the North. A lot more um, people who don't own land can now vote. So he's very popular that way. Um, however, he loses to John Quincy Adams in the House. Um, he doesn't win the electoral vote. It goes to the House of Representatives, and they side with Adams. And then Adams chooses uh, Stephen Clay to be his uh, Secretary of State, which he dubs the Tr Bergen. Um, and in the interim between 1824 and 1828 elections, he founds the Democratic Party. Um, very notable thing. And what that does is it undermines the Adams administration, making it very difficult for Adams to do anything. Um, and then that revives the two-party system, which is what we have today, um, is kind of a cornerstone to American politics. Um, and then you see divisive politics, which is still around today, and the party survives to this day. Um, and with the Democratic Party in 1828, he runs again. Um, it's a brutal campaign trail. It's not really a lot of slander is going around there. Um, and uh, Jackson is once again called the Tribune of the People, showing how he's really popular with them. Um, and he actually wins this time, and he dubs himself the people's president. As such, because he sees himself as the people's president, he thinks when they put him in office, any of his policies are approved by the people, so he starts doing what he wants. Um, with that, he makes a really big step in expanding the federal office by vetoing off of politics and not constitutionality. Um, that has huge ramifications. Uh, it just means that basically, if he doesn't like something, it gets shot down. There are six people before him, um, if they didn't like something, they still passed it. They just viewed it on constitutionality. Um, but this has a strong precedent for successors. Um, any president after Jackson will just shoot down a bill if they don't like it. Um, and then this is the Peggy Ian affair. Um, this has not too much to do with the expansion of the federal office, but it is notable in the formation of the Kitchen Cabinet, which is an informal group of advisors to Jackson. Um, really what happens is this woman, uh, she's you know not the most stand-up-y kind of woman. Um, so she, uh, you know, she has uh, some debates over um, with John Eaton, who was the Secretary of War, and there's some adultery happening there. And basically, what happens is it splits. Um, it moves from morality debate to a political debate as Calhoun and Van Buren start to take sides. And ultimately, what that happens is it ostracizes Calhoun and sets Van Buren up to be the successor of Jackson. Um, another big thing Jackson did is the spoil system. What that did was basically when he got into the office, he got rid of what, 10% 10, 10 of the people who held the positions, which was a lot at the time. And he didn't install it with people based on merit. He installed it with people based on whom he liked, which has big ramifications and would lead to more corruption, which he sought to remove. Until the uh, Penalty Civil Service Act of 18 whatever, um, that, that happens after Garfield is shot and they have to reform it. Native expulsion, this is probably his most famous thing, sadly. Um, basically, he kicks out all the natives uh, in the South. Um, and what that does, it expands the South again for slavery. Um, a big thing here when he expands the federal office is that the court, the Supreme Court actually sides with the natives on this. Except Jackson 
towards the military, so he decides not to enforce it, and he still takes them out. With you get betrayal too, you get engine re relocation, you get wars, and you get more deaths. Not good stuff for Jackson. Um, the National Bank is another big thing with Jackson. Um, he really did not like the bank. Um, being poor and young, he never had a big trusting for banks, so he believes it corrupt, and he spends his entire career trying to take it down. Um, after the election of '32, which was the campaign for that was mostly centered on the bank. Um, he took that as the people's mandate for the death of the bank, so he gets rid of it, um, which basically leads to a panic later, and there is no federal bank until 1913 when Wilson uh, reinstates it. Then you have the nullification crisis. Um, so the Tampa abomination is passed, and the South is really not happy with that because they see it as an economic strangle to them. Um, so the South Carolina threatens secession. Um, Jackson, being militaristic as he is, threatens force to put down the uh, the threats of secession. And while no, no secession or war actually happens here, Lincoln would cite this incident to put down um, uh, the uh, Confederate States during the Civil War. And then foreign affairs is, another, is a minor aspect for Jackson, but he gained newfound respect for America, recovered debts. Um, the big thing was Manifest Destiny. He himself didn't do it, but he encouraged Polk to go west, which uh, had the uh, Mexican-American War, which also has a lot of deaths of it. Uh, Second Great Awakening and Reform, this wasn't necessarily due to Jackson, but it was because he formed the Democratic Party, the Whigs formed a counter party to stop that, and the Whigs started doing all these reforms, which was temperance, women's rights, ab abolition, prison reform, education. Uh, the Second Great Awakening, they had the re religious revival under him. Um, but again, Jackson didn't do this. This was spawned from hate against Jackson. And then a final look. Um, he really expanded the federal power. Um, the biggest thing he did was probably expanding the veto to being based off of what he liked. Uh, the spoil system had its own repercussions. Indians had their repercussions. Um, uh, Western expansion had another thing. Um, you gain a lot of land because of Jackson's own politics and beliefs. Uh, dissolution of the bank led to a lot of panics until the Federal Reserve was instated. And then the Democratic Party is another big one, something that we still see to this day. That's it. That is it. Yeah. Um, not the best guy in the world. Would you, would you put him in your top five worst guys? Um, his morality is questionable, but he believed he was doing good. Um, I don't think, like, when he got rid of the natives, he wanted slavery to rise. He just wanted e an economic stronghold in the South. Um, it's tough to tell with him. Um, he's human. There's good and bad a aspects to him. Um, probably he... In terms of morality, he's probably not ranked as well, but in terms of what he did as a president, he's probably ranked pretty high in terms of his importance. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. on right okay so uh, I'm Connor and this is my capstone project basically what I did was okay, let me restart what I did here was
his heart for my hand throughout it. It's not that my really good to be standing here right now. Who the fool is my hours? Was that uh, so? I basically my internship was was I I like to look at it as not as a real job but as real life because what I my hours was was taking was just being there, being that that upper that that student. Because I joined the select team to say yes, I can be on the select team. I can prove on the select team. But I tried my best by taking accelerated roles part of FYF, but just but leadership roles what I what I really strove for as I attempted to share as Catholic and Franciscan presence to the students and with the students. Namely, one of the most important things, in my opinion, is the freshman retreat. As shown here, the picture of me, Brandon Dunner, and I think it truthfully is the most influential step Franklin Square has seen. I remember mine like it was yesterday. And if you, I think if you ask any senior, they remember their freshman retreat very vividly. And uh, it's because it's so influential because it's after the sports on. It's, it's it's run by seniors. Obviously, they have expanded it as we've gone on, but it's run by seniors for freshmen. And these seniors will leave as these freshmen drive to our ranks, to our school. And uh, in this COVID world, we just we tried our best to help everyone get to know each other. I made a note here. It was I s and it's ironic because it I said, unfortunately, I'm one of only a small group of students that's met as a freshman. So as of yesterday, we had our freshman field day. We finally got that uh, the entire freshman class together. And it's, <laughs> it's crazy to say that it's March 11th and not August, because it's whenever the freshman retreat is. Values which I've learned throughout this internship. To start, I have, uh, going back to the COVID thing, flexibility. Everyone here knows it. It's been through school. A lot of teachers here. I think we're all teachers here, right? Yes, I think so. And it's just hope and pray we never have to do this again. And because being flexible, whether it's sports, academic, social, anything, it's very hard to work around. Uh, having to go outside my comfort zone. I'm not a person that is usually one to stand up in front of people. So freshman retreats that in front of 60 people is one thing. And we have 700 in the waiting room today. That's, <laughs> that's nothing small. <laughs> um, and then growing my own faith. Now I'm not, I won't ever claim to be the most religious person, but going to a Catholic school here, being part of religious activities here has definitely propelled me forward or has, I think, grown for religious importance in my life. I, I wouldn't say I'm the most faith person, I just think that I do, it's, it's always in the back of my head, what God did at Mary. And then this pic is kind of all together. This is part of the Pillar of Christ. It's part of that passion choice and religious aspect. This picture, this is, <laughs> I can't do this for standing by myself. <laughs> um, uh, some other things is some other things I've learned throughout my experience is that a bunch of bunch of new uh, adjectives to describe myself empathy. I've been that scared kid at freshman retreat. I've been that I I had soccer when I came here. Yet still didn't any environment in me say come because I wasn't legally formal. So and that's that's me. That's you. You have a whole new clothing. Uh, I've only been in for for the interview and now meeting everybody. Patience is that I have a lot of, I've had to work with a lot of people that aren't me. I'm, I'm a unique per person and now freshmen are unique. I mean, they're growing into themselves, learning who they are. And, and yeah. Humility, because uh, as a participation in all these events is, is tough. It's a thing to climb. I don't think I can be close to anyone right now. Having the motivation to get up and, and actually do these things is that can be tough. And then the ability to enrich and gain new relationships through these times. Funny enough, 
is doing the freshman retreat and the freshman field day yesterday, almost every freshman will probably know me because I do the crow chant. <laughs> and <laughs> it's not my favorite thing in the world, but hey, if they, knowing a senior as a freshman is pretty cool, at least in my opinion. So if that helps them, good for them. <laughs> uh, then application to my future, my last point. This internship has shown a different importance to me in passing down what I believe in so that they can teach new people into my profession. I'm trying to get people to join the club team as sophomore and junior to be more involved. Just passing down that importance because I, I, I very enjoyed my time here. And I hope everyone else who goes to the school will feel the same way when they graduate. Just knowledge, traditions, personal beliefs, etc. Just passed down because you don't want you don't want someone to go through this at a very linear pace. You up down high school the whole journey. <laughs> and uh, the my experiences have also allowed me to enter a different aspect of my life. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a very Mac Clay student. With with Mac, it's kind of I wouldn't I don't. I don't usually kind of sound sad, but it's it's kind of a right and a wrong. This one, it has, uh, allows me to be more creative. Now there's more thought process and uh, problem solving in math, but this time I'm not working with math. I'm working with people. That's very, very, very different. And uh, I've just, I've learned to adapt socially, creatively to a plethora of different situations now. I've gone outside my own true self nature with just being outside my comfort zone now. And uh, with that, I don't think I have much more. So I will uh, conclude it there. Thank you. What, if you could point to an experience over the last year working with them, what was um, like an experience that you feel like really was something kind of specific that put you the most out of your comfort zone? So not like all of freshman retreat, but maybe an instance at that. I'm Ryan. I did my presentation on CTE, which is Chronic Traumatic 
encephalopathy and I just with a specific emphasis of its impact on football. So starting with a brief science, it's a degenerative brain disease, which means it gets worse over time and the symptoms will start to become more severe over time and I'll explain why that is. CT, CTE directly impacts the functions of neurons, which send signals to our bodies and mostly are responsible for the motor functions, so movements, things like that. The repeated blows to the head damage the axon of the neuron and the microtubules in the brain. And the most significant thing there is the microtubules. They're very small, very fragile, but they're supported and protected by a protein called tau, which in the picture it's kind of hard to see, but it's those blue string-like, almost look like hairs off of those of the microtubules. And as the microtubules begin to disintegrate and fall apart, it releases the tau into fo flo float freely over the brain and uh, a, pr a process called phosphorla phosphorylation can take place where they'll clump together and that begins killing brain cells and uh, lowering the brain weight and just brain function in total. And uh, after this, prion spread can occur but this is why it's still kind of a mystery, because in some it occurs at such a rapid rate um, than others, and some it doesn't really occur at all. And this is where it just continues to spread even after the head trauma is over. So this is why after years you'll start seeing symptoms come up. Now next is the research and the evidence of CTE in football. The first discovery that really got the ball rolling and made a lot of people aware was Mike Webster. And he was, after his death, um, Bennett Amalu was the doctor who performed his autopsy and discovered and diagnosed him with CTE. So after this, there were countless um, studies done to see, and the VABU CLF brain bank was formed by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Boston University, and the Concussion Legacy, Legacy Foundation. They consist of more than 600 brains, 325 of which have been diagnosed with CTE and 200 of those who um, had regularly participated in tackle football. And uh, in 2019, there was a study led by Boston University that displayed the correlation between the length of exposure and the risk of CTE. So the longer you play, the higher risk of CTE goes up. It increases by 30% for each year one plays. And this is also true to youth football, as one who begins playing tackle football at the age of five has a 10 times um, more likely chance of developing CTE than someone who began playing at 14, which is really scary to think about when you talk about youth football. And in 2009, Anne McKee, who was responsible for a lot of these studies, conducted a study on 34 former NFL players, and she found that there was a correlation to helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact, and as well supporting that the length of one's career correlated to this. And probably the biggest um, study that's been released is on the bottom there in 2017, a study of 111 um, past retired football players was conducted and 110 of them, which is about 99% were diagnosed with CTE, which is really scary. But now these numbers aren't saying that 99% of all football players have it, but those who showed symptoms and their brains were donated by families who usually suspected that there could be something wrong, 99% of those had CTE. Now the diagnosis, because, it is, because of its nature, um, and the tau in the brain, it can only be certainly diagnosed after, after death in an autopsy. They analyze the brain tissue by using chemicals uh, that can make the tau proteins visible and see the patterns and understand what happened and if it was CTE or not. But they can study the patient to uh, look at the symptoms and rule out other causes, maybe like Alzheimer's or YOB, to kind of narrow it down and begin to treat the symptoms which we'll get into later. But there are two new um, ways about that they wanna try to get to diagnosis, which is PET scans, which is the positron emission tomography and fluid-based biomarkers. And in PET scans, they use a tracing chemical, which they'll inject into the veins of the patients and they can actually track it up into the brain. And uh, that'll light up the tau proteins and you'll see. And uh, the biomarkers kind of work in a similar way where they're into the bloodstream and they identify abnormal um, concentrations of tau protein in the blood, but they're still under research and testing. They're not 100% reliable. Now the symptoms, 
the, like I said, the symptoms are not known really exactly, but there's a lot of common ones, which is memory and thinking problems, confusion, personality changes, erratic behavior, aggression, suicidal thoughts. Suicide is a, a big theme and really sad when you look into these cases with CTE. And they, they usually don't appear till years after, which is also so you're, while you're playing a sport or having these head traumas, you're hurting yourself without even realizing it. And it is linked with a higher risk of dementia as well. So treatment and, and prevention. The most effective way to prevent it is just to avoid head impacts as much as you can. And uh, as there's no treatment for it, you can try to control the symptoms. And some of these are by like therapies, um, behavior therapies to control mood swings and depression, pain, pain management. So you can use uh, medicines, acupuncture or massage. And memory exercises are used to help strengthen the, the cognitive function. Now the impact on football. So the state legislators in five states, which was Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, California, and Maryland, all pushed to, to have um, bans to youth football. And none of them were successful. The Massachusetts garnered the most um, movement. They were close somewhat, but it was surprising to me that Maryland was met with great opposition from local media and citizens as there was a petition that got over 7,000 signatures to stop um, the ban on youth football. And youth football bans are already instituted in Canada and growing awareness is, is being seen among parents as there was a survey by the University of Washington School of Medicine of over a thousand parents that found that 61% of them were in favor of youth football bans. And even though there are no bans, the participation does continue to fall. 5.8% drop in core participation was measured from 2017 to 2018. And core participation is really what you wanna look at because if you look at the overall numbers, it doesn't seem like that big of a, a drop at only 1.3% but the core participation represents those who have regularly participated um, and them dropping out kind of shows that before they were so committed to this, but now after learning this, this may not be for them and it's not worth the risk. And there are also a lot of NFL players retiring in like their prime and at young ages. Luke Keekley is one. He was a seven time pro bowler, retired at 28, um, prime age really. And Rob Gronkowski, Gronkowski which is generally regarded as one of the greatest tight ends of all time, retired at 29 over concerns of CTE, but he's since returned. But that could be due to some of the um, changes in the NFL that we'll go over later. So this is our case study on Mike Webster, played 15 seasons at center for the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is a, um, a position that has a lot of helmet to helmet contact as you're blocking on every play. And he's believed to have suffered numerous concussions, but none of them were reported or he didn't receive for treatment for any of them, which is a common theme for football, especially in, in these eras, as you just kind of would get up and shake it off. Because if it's nothing visible, then it's not really there in their beliefs. And after he retired, his family realized significant changes in his behavior. He was physically disoriented a lot of times. He was no, no longer able to complete tasks that he usually could do with no problem. And when he would even um, just get in his car and disappear from his family for days at a time. His symptoms began to wreak havoc on his life in 1992 when his house was foreclosed on and his wife left him. And from then on until his death, he was really from hotel to hotel, homeless. And he did have a family and he had children. So it's very sad. And his, he was even reported his condition grew so bad that he would have to zap himself with a taser gun that he bought to um, stimulate his nerves so he could stop his shaking his w because of how bad his condition had grown. And now this was kind of a wake up call for the everyone involved in the NFL, uh, what the risks they're taking at every time they step on the field. And he's not the only player, although he has one of the, one of the standout cases, but Junior Seau and Andre Waters, and Junior Seau is a Hall of Famer. They both suffer from CTE and committed suicide, tragically. Now after this, in 2017, the NFL um, documented 291 concussions across the league, which was a record high. And so they employed Dr. Jeff Crandall to try to 
fix this and find solutions how they could lower this number. Who is a Jeff Randall is a biomechanical engineer who works with his firm Biocore. And first, they wanted to do was address and fix the kickoff as it was accountable for 12% of the concussions sustained, but only represented 6% of plays in the NFL. And they found that two out of every three concussions were caused by a technique called the wedge block, which is where two um, usually linemen on the on the receiving team will lock arms or lock hands and go and block the the kicking team. And this caused like a high amount of impact on big guys that were 200 plus pounds to guys that were running at extreme speeds that were a lot smaller than them. So they decided to ban the wedge block and uh, they encouraged getting the big men off the field on kickoffs and uh, stopping the, um, the run-ups before kickoffs as well. They also want to identify the causing forces behind concussions and what she found, um, Biocor and Crandall found 459 um, causes for the concussions. They identified the causing forces, the data points like the position of the body, the forces involved and the locations and they actually found that rotational forces which is when a player would get struck on the side of his head was responsible for more of the concussions than the blunt impact so this called it the when you're hit on the side of your head it causes a shearing effect on your brain which is just traumatic and after that they decided to outlaw they did a test actually where they um, simulated these these actions onto 34 different helmet models and the 10 worst scoring also correlated with the 10 um, models of helmets that had the highest rate of concussions on the field. So they outlawed those 10 helmets and they saw that players were, when making tackles, were lowering their heads and straightening their backs to initiate contact and this spear-like um, technique really Im increased the um, amount of force that was applied to the player as they're making a hit. And it's not only detrimental to um, the offensive player that's receiving the hit, but also the defensive player as Ryan Shazier um, is one of the most tragic cases of this, suffered this and it almost paralyzed him and ended his career after he lowered his helmet to um, make a tackle. So this initiated the helmet rule, which the player will be flagged and for allowing their helmet to initiate contact at all. It doesn't matter if it's helmet to helmet or anything, but this encourages you to like stand up straight while making a tackle, which lowers the incidence of helmet to helmet contact. They also made an effort to spread awareness as they sent out a 107 page medical playbook to all NFL players on concussion um, signs and concussion prevention and even details about CTE. And to implement these rules, you saw the, all the rule changes and the policy changes. They also made it a priority to enforce their concussion protocol, which is something that had not been a huge focus before, and a representative sent to each team to make sure the protocol is being um, carried out correctly, otherwise there could be fines made. And now the results, right? they seem encouraging now, and it's definitely trending in the right dis um, direction as the rate on kickoffs, the touchbacks, has increased, which means there's less ch there's less kickoffs being um, returned, so they're just being kneeled back. So less chance of of those impacts that would cause the detrimental um, injuries. And the concussion rate fell 23.8 percent down to 214 from 291. Um, that was just in one year. And now, although the number did rise slightly in 2019, uh, it was still a lot less than it was in in 2017. So these efforts are seem to be successful so far. There's definitely more steps that need to be taken, but it's promising. No, that's it. Um, it's interesting because before I did this paper, I would definitely, I wouldn't tell them, but after this, um, it's really scary and no, I don't think I would because it's, yeah, it's not worth it.
Hello everyone, my name is Sam Stitz and I am presenting my capstone experiment experience. Off to do it. <laughs> uh, so I did an internship um, with physical therapy. Uh, my interest began about a year ago when I injured my back. I actually had a stress fracture in my back and I was out for hockey for two or three months. I was like, this is the end of the world. This is the end of the world. <laughs> but it turns out that I actually learned something um, very valuable from this experience. And I got to do therapy for two months. And I was in there. And I realized that this is a job that I would possibly want for the future. Um, just through what the therapists do and how they're constantly like moving and teaching people and more active. I'm not a type of guy I sit at a desk all day. So I thought, this is, this is great. And this is something that I would want to do in the future. Um, and this internship allowed me to experience different aspects of the job. Um, when I was last year, when I injured my back, I got to see the patient standpoint of you. Um, and this time through my internship, I was able to see kind of what goes through the therapist's mind. Um, he would talk me through his thinking processes, and it helped me get that aspect, which I found very valuable. My experience, um, I worked with Curly alumnus John Nietzschebitz uh, at Active Life and Sports Physical Therapy. Um, very thankful for him and Ms. Joes and Mr. Joseph for setting this up for me. Um, here, uh, I learned some really intriguing experiences that I really never had before, never seen before. Um, the first is in the top right corner. Uh, it's called the Frenzel Goggles, and the first day, um, I did my internship, I went in there, and one of his patients had vertigo, and they used this, um, this, these goggles to uh, look into their eye, it illuminates their eye, so the therapist can see their eye better, and their eye will drift like a certain way, and they have to turn them over for like five minutes, and then turn them back into different positions, and that'll help reset the process, and he said that if they go to him, two two times a week for um, about like a week or two. They said it'll be completely solved. And he's, a lot of the scientists don't know what causes vertigo. He said it's like these micro crystals that form in your inner ear and they kind of create imbalance um, to that part. And it kind of, um, the process of him maneuvering the patient helps maneuver those crystals out of the ear and helps them uh, regain their balance. Um, the next is a traction machine, right down there on the bottom right. Um, it's a machine where you tie it uh, around their head, sometimes in different parts, depending on what you're trying to hit. Um, it is used to relieve pressure on a patient's spine and kind of alleviate pain from joints, create separation uh, through the bone, healthy separation though, not over hyperextension or anything like that. Healthy separation to create more space and blood flow. Um, right there, you can see the patient is uh, definitely enduring some neck pain because it's strapped around his head and the traction machine's pulling on um, the neck. And I found it was, it was crazy. He set the machine to 20 to 30 pounds. That's the usual or the standard um, weight or, or pull on the patient on their neck. And I thought that was pretty crazy because how vulnerable the neck is sometimes with injuries and getting hit there. So that's 30 to or 20 to 30 pounds of pull. And I even found it even more interesting that when they have a lumbar um, or lower back injury, uh, it can be up to half your body weight. So if you weigh 180 pounds, it'll be 90 pounds of pool. So I thought that was pretty crazy. Um, the next is uh, next is dry needling. Uh, this is, which I have a picture down here in the next slide. This is what dry needling is. Um, he did this to multiple patients. Uh, it's the needle goes into the patient wherever they're feeling the pain and it's a thin needle and they're called trigger points and you try the therapist tries to hit the trigger points wherever you're s experiencing the pain it's almost like a buildup of stress in the muscle and overuse so when they hit the trigger points it um, it's supposed to heal the tissue and restore muscle function um, I was actually able to receive this dry needling. I'm not a needle person whatsoever. Hate needles. Whenever I go to the doctors, always get the shakes and get nauseous and everything. But um, 
he was able to do it to me. I had an injury over the weekend for hockey on my hip, and he was able to do it on my hip, and it, it's a new type of therapy, very popular in these uh, upcoming years, and it worked really well. And I actually have a funny story with this. The first time I got uh, dry needling, it was when I had my lower back. And I go in there, and we had it scheduled up. I was pretty nervous. And the guy does my dry needling. It hurts. It hurts a lot <laughs> because it's all that, all that overuse of the muscle and all, all the pressure that was building up. He reset it, and I'm coming out, and... I'm hobbling. I can't walk because I'm so sore. All that, all the pain and stuff just relieved, but you get really sore. And I was walking out, and I'm walking out like to the car, and I can't get in the car. I'm trying to open the door. I'm like fidgeting in. I can't. I can't get in the car. I'm like, what's happening here? My mom was taking me home. She, I found out a few few weeks ago actually. She was like, yeah, I was like really nervous that first time you got it. I thought the guy paralyzed you or something. <laughs> I was like, she no no. Because these, these people, I asked Mr. Nietzsche-Bitz, and he said that you need over like 100 hours or so um, with learning and hands-on work and stuff. So he knew exactly what he was doing, but it is you get extremely sore. So we could use them things that Jake Michael had presented earlier, them ways of healing. Um, so, yeah, I found that pretty interesting. Uh, and also I worked with college technicians, which I found very helpful. Um, in learning the processes of what they're going through in college and their uh, classes. A lot of them are taking, they're, they're attending Towson University and they're majoring in exercise and sports science. Um, a lot of them, some of them were uh, actually applying for physical therapy programs um, over the, uh, around the country and they were trying to get into them. Um, and these students, they often quiz me on names of exercises and all sorts of things. and. I actually found it immediately helpful. I'm taking AP Anatomy and Physiology this year, and I learned, like, we're literally doing the same thing. So, like, all these exercises, I was, like, a week ahead of my whole class. So I, I knew a lot of this stuff going into it, which was very helpful. All right. Finally, learning points and takeaways from my experience. Um, on an intellectual level, I learned, like, different techniques such as like the shotgun position, which helps adjust the SI joints, um, your hips and back. Um, and I also learned uh, ways to help strengthen muscles and reduce pain. I also learned that confidence is crucial in gaining trust with your patient. If you don't have confidence, then they're not going to have confidence in themselves and they're not going to have confidence in the process. So they may start uh, slacking and lacking off because they don't feel like this is going to work. So you have to show your confidence to them in order to um, get a good successful end result. Um, and finally, uh, being personal with patients is always significant. Um, that, that's one of the most important things. Being able to connect with your patient on an emotional level is very important because you need to know their background, where they come from, and what motivates them um, so you can get the best results you can. Um, and along with this, I learned many other little things such as like preparing a room, uses for equipment, and identifying other um, various injuries. That's it. Thank you. Did you get any repeat patients or did it usually like what's your plan? Did you like to do multiple? Oh, I got a ton. It was I actually ended up going on Tuesdays throughout cuz that was my open day and I went right after school to like 8:30 and a lot of the patients they schedule weeks ahead, months prior, so they're always going usually on like a Tuesday, Thursday or whatever. So yeah, I got to see a lot of them. It was cool seeing their development and their got stronger and stronger. And a lot of times I got to see new patients too where he uh, they'd never been to physical therapy before and they just recovered from something or from a surgery uh, and they're coming in to strengthen. And I got to see like um, Mr. Nietzsche-Bitz uh, identifying like the problem. And it's unsure at first, you're not gonna know on the first day. so. He was able to kind of narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down, and then he finally figured it out, and then you strengthen from there. So it was, yeah, it was really cool. Is there a difference between the needling and the acupuncture? Yes, there is. Um, dry needling is, um, they they take the thing, acupuncture is where they hold, uh, where they stick the needles in, and they let them lay there, and it's they're similar, but. Um, Dry needling is, I think, taking like the upper hand over these past few years, 
with um with the therapy and i think it's become more popular in like athletes um with people using it on athletes because they find it more effective because you're going in like deeper and you're hitting the muscle trigger points um whereas acupuncture is more over like a broader area and you're just sticking it in to try to get the broad um general in the I don't know what you call it, the area around the injury. Yeah. Um, yeah, it depends. It depends. He, you don't get dry needling for everything. I had to, he examined me first and he was like, yeah, this is something that like looks inflamed and we could dry needle at. Um, it depends. A lot of times I can go in and I have a local therapist that I go to sometimes where if I feel my hips getting tight from overusing with hockey, like pushing. I use these muscles a lot. So I feel I'm getting tight and I feel pain. He can go in there and pretty much just reset everything. And that's that's the main goal of it. So yeah, it depends. Um, some injuries you can, a lot of them, he would ask the patients, you say, yeah, this is a good idea to do it. Like I'd recommend doing it. So yeah, it varies. Thank you. Okay, I want to just take a minute to thank Ms. Kangas, Mr. Malinowski, and Mr. Joseph for coming today, Mr. Joseph for doing the live stream for us. But most of all, I want to thank you. We are really, really proud of you. Doing any kind of a capstone during this COVID year was a challenge for all of us. Okay? And you rose to that challenge. You did a wonderful job with both the papers and the internships. I also want to thank you all for being very patient with all my nagging for the last six months to get you to complete these projects. So very, very proud of you guys. Good job. Hey, okay? thank you. Thank you.